Well, bloomin' heck, some stuff happened to All Out, did it not? Not only did the ghost of Tony Hawk past fight the ghost of Tony Hawk future, not only did the love child of Space Jam and Def Jam fight Bulgaria's meteor's flag, but there were three capital huge, huge debuts. Ruby Soho won the Casino Women's Battle Royal, which is a truly lovely thing to have happened after a WWE release earlier this year, but it's the twin debuts of... <laughs> and Brian Danielson that really made it seem like a seismic shift has occurred in the professional wrestling scene. A dual pair of proper, legitimate defections. WWE tried their hardest to keep both men. Ruby was pushed, Cole and Danielson jumped. Adam to finally reunite with his one true love and also Britt Baker, and Brian to begin his global tour of kicking all the best wrestlers in the world in the head. But it got us to thinking, as big news normally does, what are the other most shocking defections to have occurred in the wrestling biz when wrestlers have taken their ball and instead of going home have gone to play for the other team. I'm Adam Hailing from Parts Fun Known and here are the 10 most shocking defections in wrestling history. Which wrestler would you like to see defect to another company? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like and share this video around and to subscribe. Otherwise we'll defect to you. Ha that doesn't make, hang on, I need, we'll defect, we'll kill you. We'll kill you. Number 10, Brian Pillman. We're starting with what might be my favorite story on the list because it's a goddamn heist movie. Brian Pillman, a cavalier poodle with a gun, properly hoodwinked his way from one company to another. In WCW in the mid-90s, Pillman was developing a character that was years ahead of its time, a proto-CM Punk who tear down the fourth wall with a series of demented work shoots, creating a bizarre continuity, or should we say a loose cannon, where no one knew if he was a gimmick or he'd legitimately become unhinged. Even people within WCW didn't know. He'd physically accost Bobby Heenan at ringside without warning him, call the WCW booker at the time, Kevin Sullivan, book a man during a match and walk out before appearing to get fired. The whole thing was a scheme cooked up between Bischoff and Pillman for Brian to travel the prominent indies like ECW and stir up a hornet's nest of controversy before returning to WCW. To make it look real, the release papers Bischoff gave him were real and Pillman used that legal freedom to have a short stint in ECW before immediately double-crossing Eric and signing with WWF instead. Hustle, disloyalty, disrespect. Number nine, Mike Awesome. ECW One Night Stand 2005 is a heck of a show, famous for a number of things that we're not going to mention. However, something we've talked a little less about is an eye-watering match between iconic rivals Masato Tanaka and Mike Awesome, which is like Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, but with chair shots instead of birds. One of the fascinating things about the match is Joey Styles' commentary, where he repeatedly and ruthlessly buries Mike Awesome, so much so that you think, does Joey we really hate Mike? Yes, he did. Stemming back to a famous defection in the late 90s, Mike Awesome was ECW champion in April 2000 when, after refusing to sign a new deal with ECW over unpaid wages, which was the style at the time, he zipped over to WCW and appeared on Nitro to beat up Kevin Nash whilst wearing a bum bag, which was the style at the time, with commentary screaming, that's the ECW heavyweight champion. The ECW belt had to be gotten off Awesome and it happened in such a wonderfully forbidden door shape shattering way. Awesome dropped the belt to Taz at an ECW show, which was crazy because it was a WCW guy dropping the ECW belt to Taz, who was currently signed with WWF. It was the style at the time. Number eight, Lex Luger. The Monday Night Wars saw a whole host of insane, industry-boggling, etiquette-murdering defections, some of which we'll get to in other entries, don't you worry. Rick Rude appeared on Nitro while his last appearance on a pre-tape Raw was airing, making him the first person to appear on Nitro and Raw at the same time. Wrap your heads around that, wrestling fans. Jeff Jarrett's acrimonious departure from the big dub is infamous, but we have to talk about the defection that kicked off the war. The opening shot. The first episode of Nitro aired September 4th, 1995. The night before, on September 3rd, Lex Luger wrestled a WWF house show in Canada then, because he was out of contract with Vince's company at the time, hopped on a flight to Minnesota to appear on the premiere episode of Nitro, and he did it without telling anyone at WWF. That is bold and as blindsiding a betrayal as you can get as someone who has literally been watching a wrestling show only to see his promotion's current top champion make an appearance in the crowd to find out then and there that he signed somewhere else that is a heck of a feeling and one of the few things that me and Vince share other than a birthday and a distaste for Shane McMahon. Number seven, Medusa. 1995 was a year for WWF, it really was. House show attendance was in the 
the toilet. The roster was thinner than one of those stupid weird gel mints you put on your tongue. And Nitro kept rummaging through their allotment at night and making off with all of their stars. And because my dad, Eric Bischoff, is a messy bitch that loves drama, all these new signings were instructed not only to jump shit, but stick the knife in and give a little twist on the way out. Case in point, in 1995, the woman known in WWF as Alundra Blaze crossed over to WCW to retake her original identity of Medusa. Only issue was, she'd been let go from WWF while still being in possession of their championship belt. And when she told Eric of this, he clapped his hands together like he'd just been told it's Double Pudding Friday. Medusa was told to bring the belt to WCW, appear on Nitro with it, and drop it in a trash can live on TV where it would sit until she'd become a Lundra Blaze again and fish it out of the WWE Hall of Fame. Oh, the silly wrestling companies and their silly wrestling games. Number six, Brock Lesnar. Tell you what's nice, when your main event scene is packed with full-time proven draws, aka WWE from 1998 to 2001 inclusive. However, as the Attitude Era drew to a close, The Rock had one foot out the door, Austin had chronic neck, Foley had retired, Undertaker had been one bad bump from retirement for basically the last five years, Triple H's legs had exploded, so in late 2001, Vince had the sobering realization he had to make a new star fast. Cue the originator of the Brock Lesnar push, Brock Lesnar, debuting the night after WrestleMania 18 and was WWE champion by SummerSlam. WWE were super duper serious about making Brock Lesnar the new face of the company. Brock got over and everything was going to be fine with the company as long as that new face didn't get farm boy cross about having to travel around in those fancy planes, trains and automobiles all the time and run away to throw balls instead of men. Sadly, that's exactly what happened and right after WWE invested literal years in making Lesnar the most important man in the company, he split for the NFL, leaving WWE and its fans at Mania 20 quite peeved. Number five, Mitsuhara Misawa. Time for a Japanese wrestling story somewhere out there Tempest's little ears are pricking up and his little tail is starting to wag. There are a number of big wrestling companies in Japan, New Japan, Stardom, but for about 20 years in the 70s and 80s, the biggest was All Japan Pro Wrestling, founded by wrestling's other most famous giant, Giant Baba. However, being the biggest player in town, the company was plagued by defections and oh man, when people quit All Japan, they did it in style. The company has had like three different mass exoduses of talent in its history, in each case an entirely new promotion being formed to house all the talent that ran away. In 1990, Super World of Sport was formed by All Japan Breakaways. Ditto in 2013 when Wrestle One was formed by Keiji Muto after a mass talent resignation. But the most famous case is the formation of Pro Wrestling Noah. In 1999, Giant Baba died and the ownership of the company passed to his widow. Dismayed at the proposed direction for the company, Mitsuhawa Masara, one of the four major names in All Japan history, resigned to form a new promotion, Pro Wrestling Noah, taking with him all but two of its top native talent, a bunch of big name gaijins and it's goddamn tv slot as well total scorched earth policy although the promotion is called noah so i guess it's a total wet earth policy. Number four, Ric Flair, the natural boy, the dirty player in the game, and the man who's fueled by divorce like most cars are fueled by petrol. Ric Flair was synonymous with two major companies throughout two of the biggest decades in wrestling history, the NWA and then WCW, like Cody and AEW, like Hogan and WWE, and Anoki in New Japan. He was the guy in the company, which made it all very weird when WCW fired their biggest star and he hopped over to their biggest competitor for a cup of coffee. See, the running of the company had been taken over by Jim Hurd. Jim Hurd fundamentally misunderstood what WCW fans wanted. The fans wanted Ric Flair because he was Ric Flair. Jim Hurd wanted Ric Flair to shave his head and be renamed Spartacus and not pay him as much because Jim Hurd eats crayons. Flair refused, got canned, and like Medusa, they omitted one small thing. They forgot to get the WCW Heavyweight Championship off him before he left. So in an act that would cause Twitter to herniate today, he took the big gold belt to WWF with him. WCW sued WWF, so they eventually had to use a pixelated tag championship instead of the big gold, but still, absolute scenes. Number three, Chris Jericho. AEW is a company that is built on defection. Exodus is part of its very bone marrow, the elite defecting from New Japan, John Moxley turning new WWE contracts down, seeing WWE lifers like Paul White and Mark Henry popping in to pop Vince's blood pressure, but at the very heart of it is one key defection from a man who has a habit of it, Chris Jericho. Sure, Cody Rhodes too, but Jericho was the bigger name. Jericho was the first champion. Jericho was the first ballot WWE Hall of Famer whose day one allegiance with this new brand, this new whippersnapper of a company, helped to draw those crucial frustrated WWE fans looking for an actual alternative. And it's not even Jericho's first rodeo. Sure, his New Japan excursion was officially sanctioned at first, but he made his bones in the big dub by making a big deal of escaping WCW in its prolonged death throes. Him bolting from the company and immediately being 
being treated like a big deal, debuting in a segment with The Rock, getting to keep his WCW name, led to other such defections like The Radicals, all helping to give WWF the best mid-card in wrestling history. Also, just a little fun fact to end this entry, while in contract negotiations with WWE in 2007, Jericho teased jumping ship to TNA by posting a picture of their logo to his website. The man knows how to play the field. Number two, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. Wrestling's most lucrative boom period was the late 90s. That boom period was kicked off by WCW somehow going from Dungeon of Doom bullshit to suddenly very cool indeed overnight. WCW became very cool when Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, air quotes, invaded WCW from the WWF, wink wink. Hall and Nash saw the chance for better money in fewer days and jumped ship, but unlike those that jumped before them, they jumped with the gimmick of being WWF guys, working on behalf of Vince's company to bring down WCW. You know who I am, said Scott Hall, not explicitly calling himself Razor Ramon, but still doing the accent. The fans did know, and the fans flipped for it. It seems incredibly hokey now, but after the ludicrous real-life antics of Lex Luger, it was papered over with this tangible reality that made it instantly the biggest storyline of the year, especially after the lawsuit started flying around. That's the mark you've truly defected and not currently being wished well in your future endeavors. However, the final cherry on the NWO cake would come a short while later, courtesy of number one, Hulk Hogan. Single-handedly, wrestling's most effective turncoat. Apart from the TNA thing, we don't need to talk about the TNA thing. Way back in the early 80s, Hulk Hogan was being tipped for very big things in the AWA. Before Vince made him an offer, he couldn't refuse and Hulk left to become the biggest guy in professional wrestling, leaving Vern Gagne's AWA with such crushed hopes and dreams that the rumor persists to this day that Gagne tried to bribe Iron Sheik to break Hogan's leg in the match at Madison Square Garden intended to crown him WWF champion. Hogan pledging his considerable star power to Big Vince was instrumental in setting apart the Fed as the industry leader. But then, when the bloom came off the Fed's rose in the early 90s, Hogan skipped out to try and make movies, those were a lump of ass, so he returned to wrestling for WCW, WWF's competitor. Mr. WWF was now Mr. WCW, so he jumped from the AWA, ushered in a boom period, then jumped to WCW, and eventually ushered in a second boom period when he turned heel with the NWO. All your favorite wrestling memories as a kid? chances are most of them are down to Hulk Hogan having the brand loyalty of a capitalist mayfly. And that's our list. If you liked it, give it a share around the internet. Go on, why not? Make sure you subscribe to Parts Fun Known for more very silly wrestling content. And above all else, never forget to jam that jam.